Hi, um, today I would like to talk a little bit about um, what we need to do when we're taking photos or videos for photogrammetry. Um, the kind of um, you know, content that you're creating here can be used for all kinds of different photogrammetry software, um, reality capture or mesh mixer. Um, but I'll be focusing on um, still objects. So it's not so much about um, objects that are kind of on a, on a rotating table or something like that, but it's more about scanning uh, fixed items in space, in interiors and exteriors. Um, this is all based on um, really a couple of years of teaching photogrammetry and sort of common mistakes that I've seen that students make. So hopefully this will be helpful in uh, for you know, people who are beginners and even people who are a little bit advanced um, in terms of creating better con better sort of source, source for photogrammetry. Um, the process of photogrammetry can be roughly divided into three stages. So the first one is the kind of taking photos or videos that we're talking about in this video. Then there's processing photos. There's other videos that refer to that um, where we create actual three-dimensional geometry out of these photos. And then the third one is um, when we, you know, edit or kind of post-process these uh, meshes. So one thing that is important to note in terms of like what you need in order to start scanning, basically in most cases, you just need your phone to get started. Um, and it has a number of advantages. One is that, you know, you have it with you all the time. So you can spontaneously decide to scan something. Um, the quality at this point of most phones is so good that you'll get actually a very decent scan, especially if you have good lighting conditions. And also the file size um, won't be as big as with professional cameras. Um, that said, if you do have a professional camera, I definitely recommend using it um, and trying out you know, the differences between the two. When I have a bigger uh, project or a professional project, then I actually take photos with, and videos with both. Um, uh, just to make sure that I have, you know, the right content when it when it comes to feeding it all into the software. Um, and there's definitely, you know, uh, higher quality results that you can achieve with a DSLR camera um, or a really high end professional digital camera. So there's really um, it, it really a little bit a little bit depends on on your use case. Um, and also how good of a photographer you are, because um, with you know cell phone photos, cell phone cameras are, actually have a lot. They do a lot of the kind of photography work for you, versus with a DSLR, you'll have to learn a lot about um, about settings. So um, you know, just something to keep in mind when you're taking photos um, is the way photogrammetry works and the way that the software works. Is it basically will take your images and try to kind of find identical points within those images and then you know perform a number of calculations of ge geometrical triangulation uh, to find uh, the actual three-dimensional point of these uh, kind of same points. So you can see that in these diagrams, you know, it kind of takes the, this two photos from different angles and then finds the intersection at the exact same point and then figures out where they are in 3D. So you know, when you kind of think of that while you're taking photos, this can be really helpful because it kind of allows you to think a little bit more like the software that you're going to be feeding those images in. Um, and that brings us to the first and most important rule actually of photogrammetry, which is overlap. So, you know, when you're taking photos, you need to make sure that you have enough overlap so that these points can be aligned in space by the software. If not, the software simply won't be able to line them up and you won't get a 3D model. Um, and you really don't want to be doing that manually. Um, that's, you know, the whole point uh, and the way to make it really easy is by just taking lots of photos. Um, you know, there's a, as with everything, there's a balance. You don't want to overdo it. You want to have kind of um, a range of photos uh, for smaller projects. I usually recommend starting uh, around 50 photos uh, just because otherwise the, the times to kind of calculate the model can get much long. Um, but between 50 and 100 photos, you should generally be good once you get over 100 photos. And again, that depends on how large your photos are, what kind of camera you're using, but just as a very general guideline, over 100 photos, you might end up having longer processing times. Um, so yeah, but it is important that you know the overlap exists because otherwise it just won't work. Um, 
the recommended overlap is 60%, um, which is a guideline. You know, you can go um, definitely have more overlap. Uh, sometimes you can get away with a little bit less. Um, it depends a little bit how good the rest of your scene is set up, but 60% is a really good guideline to, to work with. Um, the second rule is, you know, you want sharp pictures. Um, that one is obvious, but it is also something to consider when you're thinking about phone cameras versus professional cameras, because professional cameras often don't have, you know, if, you, if you're working without autofocus, you might get come home with a lot of slightly blur, blurry pictures that are really high resolution. That will actually not be very helpful uh, for the work that the software has to do, you know, in terms of aligning different points on your image. So um, that's a really important one to check and to consider when you're taking your photos. And obviously when you're working with uh, sort of less than ideal light conditions when it's kind of dark, this becomes even more important. Um, the third rule is uh, you want your object to be perfectly still. Uh, so often when people start their first scanning project with scanning their friend or scanning a person, um, which I don't recommend because it actually might, you know, that person just might move ever so slightly, even if they're mostly standing still, and that will lead to a less than ideal result and maybe frustrate you. So for your first scanning project, I definitely recommend taking something that's um, not moving. And also if you're setting up some kind of scaffolding or something to hold your object up, you just wanna make sure, um, you know, if it's outdoors, that there's no wind, there's really nothing uh, affecting uh, the kind of fixed positioning of the, of the object. Obviously, sometimes we need to scan things that are not entirely fixed, but you know, try to as, as best as possible find and place objects in a way that they're not moving. Um, and the same goes, of course, not just for the object itself, but if the object is sitting on, you know, uh, some kind of base, that object shouldn't base as well, shouldn't move as well, because again, if the, if that if those things are moving around, the software is going to try to align these different points, and then they won't they won't match. Um, finally, so there's a few different ways of, uh, you know, basically approaching photogrammetry in terms of like, in terms of how you're, uh, in, in what order you're taking these pictures. So the very simplest one, if you have a small object like a sculpture or an architectural model is to do the convergent axis capture, which means basically you're walking around the object and in a circle and trying to kind of, and the object is always in the center. Uh, of your camera view and you just basically take photos from all angles and you can you can and should do that from different heights so you kind of start taking this photo from sort of underneath the object one from sort of like you know level with the object and one from above to get different angles because obviously if you don't have that angle photographed it won't be part of the model um, but if you have you know rooms or bigger objects um, you might have to try different kind of techniques. So one, another one is a parallel axis capture where you basically just walk along the object, kind of like when you're, if you're taking a panorama and then you can go around it when it has, um, when you get to the end. So there's, that's really something you have to think about before you start scanning, especially with um, larger things. And here you can see, you know, here we're still treating the object as sort of an object. And here it's a space where we go from inside out and uh, basically taking um, photos sort of from the, off the opposite wall um, in a kind of parallel way. Here is a slide from um, SOA Studio. They're a really great 3D scanning studio um, based in New York, also GSAP grad. And that, this is how they kind of set up a project. So they actually, because they have really large scanning projects, they need to kind of estimate how long it will take them to do certain things. So, you know, if it's your first scanning project, you're scanning something small, you don't need to do that as a graphic, but you should mentally kind of think about how you want to approach scanning the, the project, like, you know, kind of draw three circles around it or think about, you know, which which axes you need to, to get and what you need to capture. Um, here is a very imperfect version of that. So, you know, sometimes there are constraints. This is a house and a cat skills, and I wasn't able to walk around it in a perfect circle because there were bushes and uh, lots of elevation around. So, you know, that's really important to have keep in mind when scanning. It really depends so much on what you find and what the conditions are. Um, but you see that I just walked around a couple of times and tried to get, you know, here I really couldn't get very far from the building, but here I was able to get 
uh, a little bit further away. And also this side scanned much nicer, this side became a little bit messy. So you, you know, it's actually good to have a little bit of distance from the object because the more surrounding you have, the easier it is for the software to line everything up. If you're too close, uh, it becomes really difficult to get the 60% overlap. Um, so here you see the model that came out actually really nice from that attempt. Um, and I actually took a video here, uh, not uh, photos. And that's something that you know you can experiment with. I used to take photos and I've actually switched to taking videos um, mostly because it's just faster. So here I walked around, I think for 10 minutes, uh, relatively slowly to make sure that the images are not blurred. Um, you know, again, if you have very bright light video for outdoors, the scenes like that video is great. If it's kind of dark, then video is probably gonna not have um, high enough quality. So, but here, yeah, um, around 10 minutes and so the, the frames. So these little white things that you see, those are basically individual images that were used to, to stitch that model together. And these frames uh, were basically extracted automatically by the software. This is a reality capture um, from a video and I'll show a little bit later how to do that. Um, so, you know, once you have your, your path down, the other really, really important thing is lighting. So how, um, how that model is lit uh, will really affect the quality of your scan. Um, so I don't know why tomatoes seem to be the kind of favorite topic on the internet to, the, to describe diffuse lighting, but that is, that, that seems to be a thing. So uh, the best lighting for 3D scanning, the, you know, that will give you the most kind of even result is diffuse lighting. And I just included this image just because people always ask what is diffuse lighting. So basically when you have, you know, uh, something like the sun shining on you or a very strong light, you get very strong shadow. So like in this image on the left, um, you know, that tomato throws a strong shadow. If you have a cloudy day, the the sun rays basically get, get they get diffused, they get distributed, and the lighting becomes even and diffuse, and you get very soft shadows, like in this image. And you can achieve the same effects with like a diffuse diffuser with a glass um, or uh, you know with special kind of screens for um, for photography. So this is just um, you know you can you can read a little bit more about diffuse versus direct light. But basically, um, the less direct light you have, the better because you'll be able to walk all around the model and take photos from different angles, and they all they all have the same light quality. So here is an example on the left of diffuse lighting. So you see how there's this projectors, but they're kind of clad in this, you know, that, that that's the same uh, kind of role that the clouds would have. If you look at the sky, they basically kind of break off the light into like a thousand little rays. And then the light is kind of everywhere instead of just coming from one source. And so this little dinosaur, that's like a great scanning setup. But you might not have that at home. So you could, you know, you could use umbrellas, you could use, if you have uh, big windows, you can put um, some kind of cloth over the window. So this on the right is actually a really bad setup. You have very uneven lighting, you have lots of glare, you have direct light, you have windows in the background. So this is, I mean, it might work still, but it'll, it's definitely not an ideal setup. So this is basically a kind of, a kind of anti example of how your lighting should not be set up. Um, for interior scenes, again, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Exterior is pretty easy. You just go outside on a cloudy day and you have actually perfect conditions. Um, on the inside, you know, with windows, you have to think a little bit harder about how to achieve the diffuse lighting. So here's an example of an outdoor scene with diffuse lighting that was taken. And, you know, this is a really, really great setup with the light, but also in terms of how much detail there is around. So this strong patterned um, floor or the, this, this floor pattern actually is ideal because it gives so many points for the software to align the object. So here you can see um, that scan turned out really nice. Um, and then another thing is, um, you know, when you're choosing what to scan or when you're, when you have something that is uh, actually very even and doesn't have any kind of color or pattern to it, if you're able to, you know, draw on it or change it or stick something on it, then that will also help the software to align stuff. So if, you know, you just scan this head without, um, without these lines, it might have difficulty really finding, you know, where, you know, how to align these, these different areas because they're all gray. 
Um, so this is just an example of somebody, you know, putting uh, some tattoos, graffiti tattoos onto that guy. And that's just a trick that, you know, if you're having difficulties with your, with your scan, it might be because it doesn't have enough texture, uh, not enough information to align things. Um, and the same goes for objects that are really dark. So if you have, you know, if you're, if you're scanning something that's really dark and shiny, uh, chances are that it won't work or that you have to do something with the object, uh, change the lighting or change the object for it to work. Um, and finally, you know, if you really want to scan something in 360, you might have to build a stand for it. So here, <laughs> a funny example of a, uh, <laughs> of a cauliflower, uh, or actually it's a Romanesco that somebody built a stand for it. And, you know, I mean, this is ridiculous, but I'll show you one that I made, which is even worse. <laughs> a kind of a home setup here with, um, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't have anything else at home, so I just used spices. And it looks quite ridiculous. I mean, it's really not a pretty setup. And people are, I think we're often used in architecture school to, you know, have a white background when we're taking a photo because we think that, I mean, that's how you should be taking photos of models. But when you're 3D scanning, you want the opposite. So here I put down magazines um, because they have lots of pattern and lots of texture and that helps the camera to register the actual object that you want to be scanning. And you can later then in 3D just cut those away. So on the right, uh, you see, this is a, a, a mycelium mushroom. This is an earlier stage, but you can see that you can just cut off, you know, the rest of the scene. So it doesn't really matter how it looks around it. You just want the object itself. You want to elevate it so you're able to take photos from underneath, and you want to kind of position it so that you can, in 3D, just slice off the the floor or the bottom. Uh, but you know, you really that that's really my number one tip or trick is to put a magazine underneath your object or somewhere you know where the camera can see it because that will just really really help to align it even if your object itself uh, doesn't have lots of pattern or is not ideal in terms of scanning um yeah i think these are the main tips and tricks uh, that i can share for today and uh yeah the next the next class is going to be about you know, what to do with this content, how to feed it into the software and how to actually create these 3D models. Thank you.